Hi everyone, Brian from Sui Generis Brewing here. It is January 1st, 2025, so Happy New Year everyone. Uh, it's also about 10.30 at night when I'm recording this, so you're probably not going to see this video until the second at the earliest. In this update to the 50 meter beer project, I am going to be talking about the malt that I made over the Christmas break. Uh, this malt is going to be about 80% of the malt used in the beer that I am going to be brewing in this year's project, and it's a lager malt. Now, last year I had a lot of questions about malting, so I thought I would actually do more of a tutorial style video here to give you an idea of exactly what's involved. And in some ways the lager malt is a perfect malt for this because it is one of the simpler malts to prepare. But while it's simple on paper, it's kind of finicky in practice. Uh, we'll talk about exactly what it is that makes it finicky a little bit later in the video. Now when it comes to malting in general, the process is pretty straightforward. You take your grain, and you soak it in water to get to a certain degree of hydration. Then you allow the grain to germinate, and once it reaches the desired degree of germination, you then dry it out to stop the germination process, but lock in place all of those amylases and other enzymes that were created during germination. And finally, you toast the malt, or otherwise uh, kill in the malt, to give it some additional flavor and character. So it's a fairly simple process on the surface, but it is a little bit more complicated when you get down to the individual parts. Now the first step, I unfortunately didn't record video for this year, but I do have an entire video on it from last year's 50 meter beer project. And that is you need to figure out how much moisture is in the grain before you start. Uh, I'll try and remember to link to a video above uh, to show you how to go through that. But the simple version is, is you take a known weight of grain, you grind it as fine as possible, dry it out in the oven, and you use the before drying weight versus the after drying weight to figure out the percent uh, moisture. And the reason we need to do that is when it comes to malting, the amount of moisture that you put into the grain is really important and helps to determine the type of grain that you get. So a lager malt tends to be minimally hydrated. You're typically aiming for 37 to 42% hydration. Uh, which is enough to basically allow germination to progress most of the way through the germination process. And then basically that germinating grain runs out of water and it kind of peters out at the desired degree of modification. If you're trying to make something like say a pale ale malt, you want to be two to three per percent higher in moisture. So sort of 42 to 45 percent uh, that allows for a greater degree of germination. And some malts like uh, Abbey malts or um, melanoidin malts need even like 46 to 48% hydration because they really need a lot of moisture for all of the different processes to take place for the preparation of that malt. Now that hydration step is not as simple as simply chucking grain in water and leaving it until it's absorbed the right amount of water. Uh, there's two reasons for that. The first reason is if you soak the grain for too long, you can actually drown the grain. It does need some oxygen. There's not much oxygen in water. And so because of that, you can't just dump it in water uh, and let it sit there until it takes up enough of that water. You're going to drown some of the grain if you do that. But the second reason is actually that grain has an intrinsic sort of defense mechanism against taking up too much water. And you kind of want to inactivate that, especially if you're trying to push up into those higher moisture ranges. And the way you do that is actually very simple. You do an air rest. So you soak it for a period of time, you pull it out of the water, give that grain a chance to soak up some oxygen, and now it's not gonna drown when you put it back in water, and that intrinsic defense that prevents it from um, taking up too much water basically gets turned off, and it'll now soak up a larger quantity of water. So air rests are quite important, and in fact, when you do classical styles of malting, you spend more time doing air rests than you do actually doing soaks, because it's really the air rests that are allowing the grain to absorb and process that water. So for the lager malt, I did 12-hour soaks, followed by 12-hour air rests. That's actually not really an ideal um, ratio. You probably would rather be between 8 and 10-hour soaks, and then air rests for the rest of the day. Uh, but just because of the schedule over the Christmas break, I didn't have a choice. And so it was 12 hours in the water, 12 hours out of the water. And it took three soaks to get up to, in my case, 41% moisture. Now, at this point, I tried something new this year compared to last year. And that is I floor malted uh, this year. So in, in last year's videos, I put the malt into a plastic container. Um, and I turned and moved the malt in that. 
Uh, the one downside with that is the malt got a little bit too warm and I got some bacterial growth. So this year I tried floor malting. Uh, part of my basement's unfinished. It has a concrete floor uh, and that concrete floor is consistently around 12 to 14 degrees Celsius, which is sort of the ideal temperature range for floor malting. Now I did put down a thin food grade plastic sheet. Uh, the reason for that is my house is quite old. There's a pretty good chance there's lead in the paint that's on top of that concrete. Uh, but it turns out that using that food grade plastic was a really good idea because it made turning the malt easier. But I've kind of got ahead of myself there. So with the floor malting, what we do is we take our soaked grain and we want to layer it out on the floor in a layer, just a couple of centimeters, so an inch or so thick. And what that's going to now allow the grain to do is it's going to give it access to lots of air. That's why you don't want to pile it too deep. You don't want to, to sort of bury a bunch of the grain underneath the other grain. So you get lots of air exchange. Uh, the contact with the floor helps to keep the grain from heating up too much, which is going to slow down germination and also limit the chance of bacterial growth. And the only other thing you really need to do during this step is once or twice a day, turn that malt. Because even though we've kept the layer thin, you still want to get the stuff on the bottom and put it on top so that it has equal access to oxygen. Of course, there's some water that's going to sort of drain to the bottom, so that helps to keep the pile evenly moistened. Uh, and later on, as the roots start to sprout, it also helps to keep the malt from all balling together and forming uh, big clumps that are very difficult to deal with. So I turned the malt a couple of times a day, uh, and it only really took four days to go from uh, the chit stage, which is the stage where you can just see a little tiny bit of the rootlet sticking out to the degree of modification that I was looking for. And the way you measure modification in grain is by the length of what's called the acrospire. And the acrospire is the basically the leaf of the growing plant or the stem of the growing plant. So the roots, if you, if you imagine a grain, it's kind of an oval shaped uh, object. The roots and the stem actually come out of the base of that um, structure and the rest of it's all just starch. That's the energy for that grain. So the roots will grow down. The stem actually grows up the inside of the seed. So between the actual seed itself and the hull of the barley. And when malt is properly modified, the length of that acrospiral will be between 75% and 125% of the length of the grain. So basically uh, at 100% it's going to poke out the top. And for lager malt, we tend to be aiming for a lower degree of modification, which means that we want to be at about that 75% the length of the grain mark. So starting after a couple of days, I began very carefully peeling off the hull of my barley so that I could see that acrospire. And I did that until I found uh, that most of my samples were between 75% and 100% the length of the grain. Now for many styles of barley, you don't actually need to peel the hull. You can actually see the grain underneath of it. Um, but in my case, I am growing a very old style of barley. Uh, it has a very, very thick hull on it. And so you can't actually see the acrospire through the hull. So if you're working with a more modern variety, you won't need to peel it. You can just see it right through the edge. Uh, the, the thing to look for, if you look at the barley grain is there's a crease on one side, the acrospire will be on the other side of the grain. So opposite of that crease. Now, this is where the lager malt became finicky. Now, keep in mind that what we've done is we've given this grain just enough moisture to develop to the point where we want it to develop to. But I'm not in a proper malt house. So my air in my house is quite dry. It's winter here. Uh, the air is dry. Uh, I'm working with a relatively small volume of grain in a room that is relatively well ventilated. Uh, and so because of that, I was actually getting my top layer of malt drying to the point where it would stop germinating. And the way, reason I knew it had stopped germinating is if I took malt from the bottom of the pile, the rootlets would be quite a bit longer uh, than the malt on top. And so that's not ideal. That's quite hard on the grain for it to dry out like that and then to kind of rehydrate it. So I began lightly spraying the grain about halfway between each turn of the malt just to keep that upper layer uh, moistened. And so that added obviously an extra bit of work uh, that would not have worked if I hadn't been on holiday. Uh, if I'd been trying to do this during work, I would just had a lot of dried out grain. And that's not something I've ever had to deal with before when I've done more conventional ale style malts, because they just have so much moisture packed into the grain that that little bit of drying doesn't affect the germination. 
Uh, so that made making this lager malt a little bit more finicky, but nonetheless, after you know that three or so days, uh, I had hit the right length of the uh, Acrospire, and it was now time to start trying the malt. So I have a, a decent quality food hydrator uh, that last year worked really, really well for drying out the malt. And so that's what I wanted to use this year. But last year, I just kind of piled the grain in as best as I could uh, on a couple of flat silicone sheets. And while it worked, it wasn't the best setup. And so what I did this year is I actually made some wire screens just out of uh, hardware cloth. Um, and I can fit three of these into the dryer. And that actually increased the amount of grain that I could get in there. And it gave a lot more even drying because, of course, moisture and heat had um, could come out of both sides of the screen. Uh, so this worked really well, but there was one small hiccup. And that is that I made far more malt than even these screens would let me fit into my food dehydrator. So I had to get a, um, a round mat. And the way I did that was pretty simple. I and mean, keep in mind that this grain, even with me spraying it, is right at the moisture level where it really has no extra moisture uh, in it. You know, it's, there's just enough there to allow for germination to take place. So I loaded as much as I could into my food dehydrator, and then I just simply spread the rest out on the floor as thinly and evenly as I could, and I put a fan onto it. And within about four hours, the roots were dry enough that they had become somewhat crumbly. So it really dried out and stopped that germination process quickly, even though uh, I didn't have it at the proper temperature in the food dehydrator. And part of me was actually tempted just to dry it the whole way like that and make something called wind malt, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a malt that's been dried in the wind without any kilning. It's supposed to have somewhat of a grassy, grainy flavor to it. But I decided against that because I really did have a specific recipe in mind and that may not necessarily work with the recipe I was working for or work that I'm working towards. For the malt that was in the food dehydrator, I took it through a fairly simple drying process and kilning process. And because this is a lager malt, the kilning temperature is low enough, I could actually do the kilning in the food dehydrator itself. So the first step in that drying process is to dry the grain. And so I started off at 35 degrees Celsius for about 12 hours, at which point I turned the temperature up to 38 degrees Celsius for an additional 12 hours. And the goal there is to dry the grain out uh, below about 14% moisture as quickly as you can, but without exceeding too high of a temperature. Because keep in mind, we're not just pushing moisture out of the grain, we're also trying to preserve and lock down the enzymes that were generated during the malting process. So if we dry too hot, those enzymes will denature. But we also don't want to dry too cool because as we're drying, there are some enzymatic reactions going on in the grain, in particular something called beta-glucanase, and this is breaking down a lot of the cell wall in the grain. And that's going to make it easier to mill the grain, so it'll make the grain more friable. It's also going to make extraction of the sugar from the grain go better. So for the second step, we increase the temperature to 48 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's for about a 12-hour period. And here we're really trying to push as much moisture out of that grain as we can. Uh, we want to get the malt moisture down to below 10% because that gives you a stable malt. Uh, and it's also going to give you a malt where those enzymes are stable. So this is something that is shelf stable. It's not going to mold. It's not going to do anything crazy like that. And you're also going to preserve that enzyme activity. Uh, and so again, 48 degrees Celsius for 12 hours. And then we go to the kilning stage. And the kilning stage is where we're going to raise the temperature to a point that we are going to damage our enzymes a little bit. But we're also going to develop some Maillard reactions and some other flavors in the grain that are going to make our malt taste malty instead of grainy or grassy. So that kilning stage I did for uh, just about three and a half hours. So it's not for a very long period of time at 75 degrees Celsius, um, which for lager style, Pilsner style malts is kind of in the middle of the temperature range that you would use to toast those sorts of malts. So once the kilning of the first round of malt was done, I then took the remaining malt and took it through the same process, with the exception that I only did 12 hours at that lower temperature because it had at this point a couple of days uh, being dried out by the fan. So it was already fairly dry. I used uh, 38 degrees Celsius just to for 12 hours to just finish that drying process and then took it through that um, 
48 and then 75 degrees Celsius uh, time periods just to finish drying and to give it a little bit of kilning. And so the end product of that is I have roughly four and a half to five kilos of finished lager malt. Now I didn't show any B-roll of this, so I'm just going to try and show it to you now on camera, but this malt isn't quite completed yet. There's still two stages left. And so if we try and zoom in here, maybe you can see it there. Um, there's still a lot of rootlets left on this malt. And because of that, um, those still need to be cleaned out. Uh, rootlets will give sort of a bitter and vegetal flavor if they're not taken away. Uh, so we definitely want to get rid of those uh, before we can use this malt. And the other thing that the malt needs is just a little bit of time to essentially breathe. There are some unpleasant flavor compounds developed during the malting process, but luckily they're fairly volatile. And because of that, they will sort of off gas from the malt over a period of a few weeks, uh, at which point the malt will now be ready to use. So I still have to clean the rootlets off, still got to give it a little bit more time to off gas those off flavors, but that's all fine because I'm still preparing another batch of malt. I'm on the final day of soaking now, so it's still got at least a week of time ahead of it before it's going to be finished. And I'm going to do a whole separate video on how that malt's made because that malt is more of like a Caramunic style malt or a special bee style malt. Uh, and it's kind of the opposite of the lager malt. Um, whereas the lager malt is a pretty simple and straightforward malting process, the sort of Caramunic style malts are probably the most complex uh, form of malting out there. Uh, so it's worthy of its own video. So look for that in a week or two. Uh, so anyways, with that, I guess the video is at a close. As you can tell, we are finally in the home stretch when it comes to being ready to brew this beer. Uh, so hopefully by the end of January, we'll have the beer in the fermenter and maybe in February we'll have a tasting video. So with that, I'm Brian from Sui Generis Brewing. Thank you again for joining me in my uh, little journey here and we'll see you next video.